Good rainy January morning to you. This is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. Quite chilly, just me and the crows out here this morning. The chickens are kind of hunkering down under their awning because it's rainy. The ducks are out loving the wet weather. You can see everything looks pretty muddy and gray and dormant this time of year. I wanted to talk with y'all a little bit about permaculture design and how some of the things we've been doing around our property lately fold into our ethics of permaculture and fold into and utilize the 12 principles of permaculture. So for those of you that are new or um, have limited experience with what permaculture is, permaculture is a design system where you use the 12 principles and three ethics and you design not only your garden, not only agricultural systems, but also human society, also the structures, the homes we live in, the way we design our neighborhoods, the way we design our economics and our community interaction so that we have maximum efficiency, reduced workload, increased quality of life, increased equity for all people, and we regenerate the environment. So the guiding force behind permaculture is that if we take the time to design well, to design in ways that mimic mother nature because she has evolved over the millennia to do it better than we can. If we design well, we can not only have a positive relationship with the earth, its inhabitants, AKA other people, animals, fungi, plants, landscapes, but we can also undo the extractive, damaging ways people have interacted with the environment in the past. So permaculture focuses on resilience for people. Let's improve the quality of life for human beings, but let's do it in a way that also improves the planet and improves ecosystems and brings them back into abundance. Because the reality is, is that humans and the planet are inextricably linked. And so we can't have resilience and we can't have the highest possible quality of human existence and human societal structure without taking into account how we interact with our environment. So in those 12 principles of permaculture design, they apply to really big things and even the smallest things in life. In fact, a big permaculture principle that tends to be brought to the forefront for me all the time is um, that we want slow, small solutions. That we don't bite off more than we can chew and we take on small projects that are doable and those small projects can have big impacts. So let's talk about this project that we've been doing here. When we first bought our house, um, 13 years ago almost. We obviously just had weeds and not much else. And um, since then we've done a ton, planting more than 40 fruit trees, dozens and dozens of berry bushes and fruit canes. We have bees, we have ducks, we have chickens. We've started building an outdoor bread and pizza oven um, so that we can cook outdoors in the summer. And my hope is that can be a community uh, bread oven. It's covered with a tarp right now to keep the uh, rain off. So when we think about permaculture, we think of, well, I should back up. I know a lot of folks can get really caught up in permaculture being about independent living and self-sufficiency. And I reject that notion. I really think it's about community interdependence. It's about our interdependence with the planet and our inter interdependence with other people. So even though I'm quite introverted, I feel like connecting with the community is really, really key. 
for how we design our individual permaculture landscapes. And in the past, that's looked like we partner with a nonprofit and host free workshops and have garden volunteers here and donating the produce to a local food bank. It's looked like having friends over and sharing cuttings and um, plant starts with them. It's looked like bartering and swapping with other people in the community for new plant starts. It's looked like straight up hospitality and just having folks over to build relationships. So one of the ways that we are working on improving our permaculture design for relationships and for community resilience is that about eight years ago, we added this pergola. Let me, let me back up this way here. Again, excuse the fact that parts of our yard are really just still a construction site. Everything is always in flux and also nothing looks its best in, in January, particularly when the chickens get loose and we have two large dogs. Things look muddy and torn up. And um, so just bear with me. Come back and watch some of my videos in June or go back and watch last year's June videos and you'll see that it's a green, abundant landscape here. So one of the things about permaculture is that it was designed in Australia and the goal is really to be, well, one of the many goals is to be accessible for all people, for people in subsistence communities. So permaculture is not elitist. Permaculture is not something where you need an expensive permaculture designer charging $150 an hour to tell you where to plant things. Permaculture should be accessible for everybody. And because I really, really value that and that, um, is important to me and because our family lives that out and that we're on a real tight budget we try and do everything for free not only because it aligns with our values to reuse and repurpose and save our pennies but also to demonstrate to other people that permaculture is not expensive and it's not inaccessible for example we have our woodshed here which is built out of pallet wood and free you know stuff free shingles that someone was getting rid of on the side of the road um, pallets that we harvested from places, repurposed lumber from the rebuilding center. So there's almost no cost, right? So that's really important to us. So when we had this pergola put in eight years ago, it originally had plastic because uh, for the roof because we are right off the back of the house here, as you can see, and we face straight north. And that means that this area was really, really shaded and it wasn't great for growing things. And in fact, it just became kind of a muddy mess out the back door. And so the solution for us was to make a functional space for people and not for plants. And we felt that was a good use of looking at our landscape, observing and interacting with our landscape and seeing what would work best here. So it's quite hot here in the summer in July, August, September, we get almost no rain, but we have garden volunteers here and this created a shady spot for them. And also my main goal was when we have workshops and classes for students, for homeschool kids, for adults that range from beekeeping to urban poultry keeping to orcharding, there's a covered area back here because as you can see, it rains nine months of the year in Oregon. And that created a space where I didn't have 25 people in my living room. We have a small house and when I first started doing workshops, I had 25 muddy people in my living room and it just was not, um, it was not a good setup, right? It was not an ideal for permaculture design. We made it work, but it wasn't sustainable. So the solution was putting a pergola back here. Again, we started out with plastic because it was, uh, in my budget and because we thought this will allow more sunlight in. Well, eight years later, we've had two hailstorms which punched a bunch of holes in the plastic and a couple of windstorms which actually broke the plastic. It became brittle UV light and the constant rain just damaged the plastic. So this past week, we've been saving and saving for repairs and we reached a point where we called our contractor Tim because again, I, I have some physical limitations that mean I can't get up on a high ladder. and. We actually talked with him quite a bit. What would be the best use of our resources? What would fit with our permaculture 
principles of slow small solutions and um, working to have the most sustainable repurposable recyclable option and we actually went with a metal roof it will last it will last a lot longer and although it shades this back area it just seemed like a more sustainable option than adding more plastic. I did not feel great about having a load of plastic roofing taken to the dump um, this past week. And the metal is recyclable if we decide we are um, gonna take out this pergola in the future or what have you. So that felt more sustainable for not that much more expense. Um, so when we talk about permaculture principles, the principle of slow small solutions really comes to mind. I tend to get really hung up in feeling like I need or feeling pressure or feeling a sense of urgency about the way our society is structured and how unsustainable it is and how the needs of so many folks are not being met. And the reality is I can't make big sweeping policy changes. I can't reorganize human culture, especially particularly American culture, but I can have a slow, small solution, which is I can try and set up and I can strive for local community interdependence and connectedness and do what I can in my small way to improve uh, and build those connections between people because I really, really believe permaculture's got it right. When you have connectedness, when you value the relationships between people as well as the relationships between humans and the planet, you are more resilient. So my hope is that when COVID is over, we're on the cusp of all of us getting our vaccines in America, reaching herd immunity. My hope is by next year, we can return to having classes out here. We can return to having community gatherings, maybe having uh, plant swaps. We can have, I hope, weekly bread or pizza baking for the neighborhood. And in that way, build relationships where we can trust each other and depend on each other. Because social permaculture is good permaculture. Not only do we need to connect with our land, we need to connect with our neighbors. So let's talk a little bit about what else we've done in this pergola that um, reuses and repurposes. So when we started off here, obviously I have gravel, which I just paid for a big load of gravel to get dumped in my front yard, and then I shoveled it all back here. And for us, that was the most economical. It cost $125 um, not only to gravel this area back here, but also the end of my driveway. And then we had part of our driveway removed, and I used the concrete blocks that they cut up, and I made a little patio here. And this is a free table that was on the side of the road, and we put chairs out here. Our family can eat out here. We can have friends out here. Um, it works really well for classes, so normally there would be chairs and things. Um, all of this was free, um, or again, the 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 gravel was really minimal input. I have some old, these are our old picnic benches. The legs deteriorated, but they're nice hardwood. So I have this area here where if you've seen some of my other videos, I tend to, to cook out back here in the summer. I plug in my rice cooker and my instant pot and my crock pot out back so I don't heat up the house. This is my little platform where I do that. Um, I have my dinner bell, which actually was my parents' dinner bell. So I can ring it when the kids are out in the neighborhood or when we're having a class and we're ready to come back from the yard to meet back here. So our, our economic outlay was really, really minimal for this project for the potential benefit, which is, again, building those community bonds and feeling like when we have our permaculture design, I feel like when we have our permaculture design, it's important to, uh, I'm gonna come out here so you can see the pergola from the, from the yard again, excuse the mess. When we have our permaculture design, not only designing for our garden spaces like our annual veggie beds or our orchard or our chicken coop or our rain garden, which you can see here, there's no gutters on our pergola. There is a buried channel of gravel that is sloped here and leads into my rain garden here. 
and there's more buried gravel down here and it slopes downhill and this in a heavy rain will fill up above the top of the little bridge here and it will overflow and run downhill into my annual veggie beds. So that's all good permaculture design. But so that's why there's no gutters because we have rain capture in a rain garden. So here you can see what the pergola looks like. But just feeling like it is important to create those social spaces because I think there can be an overemphasis on individuality and the homestead mindset and self-sufficiency. But good permaculture design prioritizes making space for social permaculture and for community connectedness. So for us, this is the best way we felt um, we could sort of foster that and we could prioritize that in our lives. So I'm really looking forward to obviously an end to the pandemic and a return to health for everybody and that herd immunity. And I'm excited about the things that come along with it, which are a return to in-person social connection. Part of my doing this YouTube channel has been to supplement or um, have an, an outlet for those social connections I can't have in person at this time. So I hope that you all get some of the education and the sharing of ideas and the sharing of expertise from these videos. I hope that it, it um, means something to you and brings value to you. I know I get a lot out of it, but goodness, I'm looking forward to a day when we can have real in-person gatherings again and we can have face-to-face -face permaculture. So I hope you all are staying safe. I'm going to go inside and actually because it's such a cold rainy morning, actually there was quite a bit of ice on the chicken buckets and the, excuse me, the duck buckets this morning and the duck's uh, bathtub. I'm going to go inside and I'm going to get out my knitting and sit by the fire and just have a quiet morning and listen to my audiobook. Please stay safe. We're in the home stretch. Keep hunkering down. We'll reach herd immunity soon and I hope maybe we can get to meet each other in the future. Thanks.